Hey, I'm Slash, and you're watching Loudwire. Hey everybody, it's Gruhamid here again. It's Wikipedia Fact or Fiction time, and this is going to be a really good one, I'm sure, because we've got Slash here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm sure you're just dying to Always know. Always a bastion of information, <laughs> accurate information. In this case, absolutely, because this is all about you. All right. All right. Uh, first off, you were born Saul Hudson in London, England, and you were named after the artist Saul Steinberg. This is true. That's fact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was actually, it is London, England, but it's Hampstead, England. Okay. Your mother, Ola Hudson, was a, an African-American costume designer whose clients included David Bowie, and your father, Anthony Hudson, is an English artist who created album covers for musicians such as Neil Young and Joni Mitchell. Right. That's true. All good so far. Okay. Um, it says on here that your mother left the family shortly after your birth to pursue her career, um, despite the fact that she had obtained her profession around a year after leaving for Los Angeles. Uh, it wasn't until you were around five years old that you and your father finally joined her in L.A. Well, I mean, she didn't leave. <laughs> it did sound it, a bit dramatic. Yeah, it wasn't it? exactly like that. <laughs> I mean, she went back to L.A. because that's where she was working. We stayed in England, and finally we went to America to be together with her, and then my dad went to work over in America. So Awesome. In 1979, you decided to form a band with Steven Adler, and uh, the band never materialized, but it prompted you to take up an instrument, and it also added that Adler had designated himself the role of guitarist, so you decided to pick up the bass first. Yeah, I mean, he had a guitar, so therefore he was a guitar player. <laughs> he was the most qualified. I didn't at have that anything, time. so. <laughs> but yeah, I thought I would end up. I thought I would play bass, and then I ended up not knowing much about the difference between bass and guitar. When I met a guitar teacher, uh, he asked me, "So, why do you want to play bass? Do you have an instrument?" Blah blah. blah. I said, "No," and he was playing guitar at the time. He was doing guitar solos. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And yeah. I was like, oh, then you want to play guitar. And I was like, okay. Very cool. And so you did actually play the bass first? I did, never had one. Never had so a bass. I, yeah. But it was just a pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> it says that your first band was called Titus Sloan and you formed in 1981. I don't know what year it is, but that's a pretty good guess. Is Titus Sloan a person? Titus Sloan was this crazy name. I had this stoner friend named, who was another guitar player named Philip Davidson. And this guy was like the, the perfect example of a stony kid in high school. <laughs> anyway, and he had said something to me that just sounded, I don't know what he said, and it sounded like, I, the way I heard it in my mind was Titus Sloan. It would, didn't mean anything, but it sounded cool. So I named my band after that. Very good. Uh, I think a lot of people know this, but you auditioned for Poison, mm -hmm. uh, and that didn't come to fruition. But I, I was curious of how close did you come exactly? Um, yeah. Well, what happened was I went down there, I played the shit out of the songs, but I wasn't too keen on the dress code. Really? And okay. So that was that. So. Okay, so... Well, because Poison was a full-on 80s hair glam kind of thing. Of course, people mistook them for women. I was pretty down-to-earth, sort of, as is. It's pretty much the same as I am now. And when we had, you know, had this conversation about, like... I, I remember it was something about shoes, and I was like, huh, come again? <laughs> and it just, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. And I left there that day... And CC was walking in for his audition, and I knew that so that's going to be the guy because he was dressed to the nines and sequins and makeup, and the hair was up and the whole bit. And that's you know that was what the image was about. Damn, what was what was wrong with your shoes? Did you just come in with like I heads I was wearing, or something? I know I was wearing moccasins. Moccasins? Yeah. <laughs> that's not very poison, is it? Uh, I really liked this one. It said that you rented uh, an early 1970s Marshall. Uh, for the recording of Appetite for Destruction, mm -hmm. and that you enjoyed the amp so much that you tried to keep it by telling the rental company that it had been stolen. Right. However, the amp was repossessed by the company after a roadie accidentally brought it to a rehearsal. At SAR. At the place where you <laughs> rented it from. Yeah, that's true. Oh, my God. Were you really pissed at him? Just like, you just... I was furious, you know. I mean, it was a great sounding amp for one. And, uh, you know, and then it left me with no amp at the studio, <laughs> so I was screwed all around. Oh, boy. It says on Wikipedia that Welcome to the Jungle 
was written in approximately three hours. Yeah. There was the, the basic riff, which I already had in the intro and all that kind of stuff. And then we started working on it as a band. We had only three hours time allotted at Nikki Beat Studios. So we had three hours to get that song done. And that, whoa, that's so crazy to think that just something that... And most of the songs on that record, you know, especially musically and, and the arrangements and stuff, were all done. We had short attention spans, so we'd work really hard on it until it was finished and move on. Yeah. Wow. That's so weird to think that something that ended up being that, that big lasts as and that long big as influential that, yeah. just yeah. three hours ago it just didn't exist and now it does. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, you're a pinball enthusiast mm -hmm. and a collector of the machines and uh, you participated in the design process for the 1994 Data East Guns N' Roses pinball machine and the 1998 Sega machine Viper Knight Drive-In. Yeah. I went to a, a company called Data East because, you know, Kiss had a pinball machine, the Stones had a pinball machine, and I thought Guns N' Roses should have a pinball machine, so I designed something, and I went to this company that was pretty popular at the time called Data East, and they said, yeah, let's do it, and so we did it. Wow. So it's cool. We used the masters off the album for the music, and it, uh, at the time, it was the loudest pinball machine ever. I'm not sure if that's been surpassed or not, but... Damn. It said in 2001... Uh, you were diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, and you were originally given between six days and six weeks to live. Right. What's it like hearing that news? At the time, I just remember being concerned about how I was going to make up the dates that I canceled when I got sick in the first place. Oh, that, was, okay. that was my biggest concern. And uh, I managed to get through it, and I did make up the dates, so it's all good. Wow. So that, that's so odd to me that they would be so specific as saying six well, days. Well, you know, the reality was that was one doctor's opinion. And then the other doctor wanted to do a complete heart transplant. And then the third doctor was the one that said, no, we have a way of, of we can work this out. What's your mindset during that period? You're being, it feels like you're just being jerked around all these ways. They're thinking of ta removing your heart. Other people are saying you're going to die in less than a week. Right. But I was pretty out of it at the time. <laughs> I just, I don't think the impact, uh, you know, um, the graveness of it really hit me uh, at the time. I guess that maybe is something that I, I just, I was, you know, I was invincible. I was like, I'll get through it. And, and, uh, and that was it. I was just uh, totally like, just show me what I got to do and I'll get through it. And, and lo and behold, you know, sort of did what they told me to do. And Right, lifestyle changes, stuff like that. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. They're for, doing really well. You know. Damn it. It says that a number of singers auditioned for Velvet Revolver, including Sebastian Bach and Travis Meeks of Days of the New. Mm -hmm. And then it went on to say that Miles Kennedy, who obviously you're working with right now, actually declined an invitation to audition, as did uh, Ian Asbury of The Cult and Mike Patton of Faith No More. Yeah, I mean, actually, Miles came into it twice. The 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 first time around before Scott. So he did come in audition. He didn't. He didn't no. come. He took the music. He said, "This is great," and then we never heard from him again. Oh. And then the next time uh, after Scott, post Scott, we called him up, and he was like, "Well, I'm in this band, Alter Bridge, and I, 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 you know, I'm committed to that. I don't have time to do anything else." And so, okay, so that was yeah. Um, as far as Ian, we did. Uh, uh, extend the invitation to Ian. Um, as far as Mike Patton goes, I remember thinking about it. I don't know if we ever reached out to him or not, but okay. that sounds pretty accurate. All right, we'll count that basically fact. Uh, during the recording of the Contraband record, mm -hmm. uh, that Scott Weiland could only work for three hours a day due to a court order uh, mentioning that he was to stay in a halfway house. Yeah, he, he was, I guess it was a halfway house, yeah. So he had a uh, uh, a couple hours a day where he had to have a policeman next to him and he would work on the songs and the how wait how, how where was the cop in the studio uh, well, he, he was in the booth with him I forgot you know I when he was doing the vocals yeah the, the he was at the studio yeah looking back is that really any way to record a record sort of in a disjointed way like that it's just the way people record records all the time nowadays. Um, but that was just under the circumstances. Sure. You know, you got to make do with what you got to make. Yeah. The Libertad album. Uh, you said that the mutual participation was so great on that record that it even surpassed the first Guns N' Roses sessions. That didn't come out of my mouth. 
No? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, fiction. <laughs> fiction, finally. Uh, I found this interesting. Uh, the Apocalyptic Love Record. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole album was recorded with analog equipment only. Right. That's true. How much did that cost? Because tape is not cheap these days. No, I mean, well, this last record uh, we just did was recorded on tape as well. And the first solo record I did was on wow. tape. Um, you know, it wasn't too bad, but all things considered, we were reusing the tape as much as possible. Sure, so. you, you know, go over it. Yeah. Uh, how much does that end up costing in the end? Is, is it a really big difference in the end? Well, you know, it's like it, the, the getting the tape at the time, like on the Apocalyptic Love record, actually, we found somebody who's manufacturing tape, and so it wasn't that expensive. The first solo record, though, um, we managed to find a stockpile of tape, and it was pretty expensive. So, oh. yeah, compared to a digital record, it was a little bit of money. But worth it for like that kind of warmer it sound. Yeah, yeah, it was worth it. Now they're manufacturing tape like crazy, so... This last record we did was really easy. Yeah, I think because digital, uh, you know, digital seems like it's almost getting to the point where it's sounding almost as good as analog. Well, they've got they've got some some plugins that are actually supposed to to replicate the the warmth of uh, which is just asinine to me. But <laughs> they're working on it, and they'll keep working on it until they get it right. But uh, you know, all things considered, digital just does not sound as good. You know. Uh, yeah. Especially when you're recording bass and drums. I mean, if you're if you're do, talking about a live rock and roll band, then I I would go with tape, you know, in a heartbeat. Awesome, thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you for this playing was our intriguing game. Intriguing and exciting. And I agree. I think informative. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Slash world on fire. For God's sake, pick up the record. Thank you so much again. Nice meeting.